You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. There's a cat over here. There's a cat over there. And the wrong one died. And the wrong one died. Welcome to The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cast catastrophe. I'm your host, Mike Abrams, and today we have two amazing guests. I have met a lot of Cats couples, and we have another one here. So they met on the U.S. National Tour 4 of Cats and are now married. You might have known her as Felicia Ferrone, and she performed as Demeter, and he is James Gardner, who is working on the tour as an assistant electrician, or what I've been told is an AE2. So I've got questions we will ask that about. Uh, to learn more, but I'm excited to talk to another Cats couple. So welcome to both of you, and thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, Mike. Thanks. My pleasure. Thanks for having us. Excited to have you. I'm I'm fascinated by the amount of Cats couples I've met now, yeah. and I'm wondering what it is about this show that has created so many happy marriages. Wow. And we will get to your meeting on tour, but I always have to start at the beginning of your Cats history. So tell me about the first time you saw the show, you were exposed to the show, and I'm assuming that was hopefully before you started working on it and were in the show. Should I go first? Um, yeah, I saw it in 1982. So I think actually it was, maybe it had been in preview, previews. And I was a senior in college and we drove in. I think it was with my high school and college boyfriend at the time. And I was blown away by it. I loved it. and. Yeah, that was it. I mean, I was hoping to one day be in it, but I, you know, I, I it was just kind of early on in my even my even thought process of whether I was even going to do this for a living or not. Okay, so you saw it as a high schooler? No, no, actually, and college senior. College. Okay, so you you're seeing at a point in life where you recognize everything happening, right? But it's early in the show's run. Oh yeah. So it's not. It doesn't probably have the same lure as it does today. No, but you got to see it like early on and at a point where some of those storylines that I think children miss, you probably caught. You would think that, but as you probably heard from other people that you've interviewed, it's a little bit confusing when you're just yeah. bombarded by all the visuals, you know, and yeah, and it's such an amazingly um, creatively visual show so that that's kind of what I was caught up in. And just mm-hmm. looking at and and at the amazing bodies and how people were moving their bodies and it was really I was a dancer you know so it it really was a dancer's dream to imagine yeah. doing something like that. Did you, as you watched as a dancer, did you pinpoint one or two characters that you were like, I I want to do this? You know, I didn't at the time. I don't know why. Okay. I don't remember feeling that. Maybe I thought it was like still so out of reach. I'm not sure. Yeah, early in the career still, or maybe even yeah. before yeah, you kind I mean, of officially before. started. Exactly. Yeah. James, what about you? When was the first time you saw it? I actually saw it the first time in New Haven when we did production. I did not oh. see the show. Oh. I was in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I was raised uh, when Cats opened. And so actually, I remember seeing the Life, reading the Life magazine special that they had on Cats. Hmm. And seeing all the costumes and how theatrical it was and what, thinking to myself, wow, that'd be really something if I ever ended up on that. Uh, just because it was such an extravagance. Uh, but like I said, I was, I was out in Albuquerque when it first opened and uh, moved to New York in 1985. Okay. So it, it, it was running, but. When I moved to New York, I did not get a chance to see it. And then I got offered the show. So that's really when I got to see it first. And yeah. I, I, I was living in New Jersey, by the way. So that's okay. I'm going to do the Jonathan. Yeah. So, so James, I'd love to hear from you about your, how you got the show. Cause like, you know, I know the as a performer, there's the auditions and there's all the stuff that goes into it. But as someone working behind the scenes, what was your experience like kind of becoming on, uh, the electrician and, and working on sound as a, you know, um, on the tour. So in Albuquerque, New Mexico, there's what's called a roadhouse where actually we played, uh, when we started the show the first year, we played what is called Hope Joy Hall. And it's a giant 2000 seat auditorium. It's the largest theater in New Mexico. Now, I was part of the house. I was part of the house crew and I, um, met a guy 
who kept coming through with different shows. He was, he became my boss on Cats and he and I became very good friends. And we actually, my first show that I did was Bob Fosse's Dancing on tour. Okay. So he was the sound man on that show. And I was the assistant electrician running a, a tower spotlight on Bob Fosse's Dancing. So I moved to New York City and then Kevin, his name is Kevin Keen. Kevin got cats and asked me if I wanted to be his assistant. And so we had to go through the head electrician, whose name was J.R. Sample. And J.R., I met J.R. in a bar, of course, in New York. And uh, he, uh, he said, sure. And uh, I was very, it turned out to be, it really, besides the best thing in my life, which was finding Felicia and marrying Felicia, but um, my involvement with J.R. Sample uh, was fantastic for me because um, he, after he left Cats, he got the national tour of Les Miserables. And Jeez. after I left, I left Cats to go do Starlight Express. And then I left Starlight Express and he had just gotten Les Miserables. And he said, hey, I'm looking for an assistant. So I became the assistant electrician on Les Miserables. And then when I moved to New York, that's what opened the door. I was a shoe in for a sub on the spots on the Broadway version. And wow. that's how, instead of having to go back out on the road, because I didn't know about anybody in New York, because I knew the, all the spots, I knew how to call the show. So I became the assistant, uh, uh, the, the sub that they loved on broadway but now you're not talking about cats i know but i'm saying that's that okay i love it it worked out so that i didn't have to go back out on tour because jr got the national or the bus and truck of phantom of the opera and he also then after he left that he got the bus and truck of lion King. so he's been very instrumental in my life uh helping me you know with you know that kind of expertise of, you know, being able to take that to Broadway. Yeah. It's interesting to like, look back on that and see how much this one tour and the, you know, introductions and people you met both personally and professionally had a <clears throat> profound impact on your life. And it's this crazy show about cats is, you know, like, it's kind of a fun thing to think about that. Well, you don't um, ask the question, like, why the, why so many couples, maybe? I mean, just think about it. There's just so many people in every company, right? Yeah. How many people did we travel with? How many I think people? there were 75 people. Wow. I didn't realize. Okay. How many? I knew there was 30-ish in the cast, right? There's there's that many cats in most of the productions. And that doesn't include the swings and the yeah. multiple people that have to kind of be ready to go and stand by for all, especially such a strenuous show there's a lot of injuries and a lot of that happens in in the show um that is i did not realize it was that big of a touring well company. there was there yeah. were about 35 to 40 cast members that we toured with they had two buses and then we had stage management we also traveled with our full orchestra of i think 12 or 14 and then the the crew was another 14 so, yeah. it's it's so logical when you say it to me. Mm -hmm. I've thought so much about this show's plot that I just keep thinking like, well, of course, I mean, this character and this character would naturally become couples and not anything about the fact that like, yeah, there's 75 of you on a bus traveling around the country in close proximities with nothing really else to do besides hang out with each other in some of these small towns that you don't know anybody Right. So your, your explanation is very logical. And I'm now like, oh, that makes a lot more sense than me thinking like, of course, Bomb Ballerina and Tugger should be together. They naturally should be together. And that's why they, and there have been a couple of those. And I forgot to also mention that there's also stage managers and company managers. And we actually didn't travel on one bus. We actually had four buses. Yeah, and you're too big for one bus. Seventy five right. is huge. We had two. We had two sleeper buses for the crew, and two normal buses for the. Uh, and then also, don't forget that we had the four bus drivers. We had five trucks, so we had five uh, truck drivers as well. So, 
when the company manager booked a hotel, that's, yeah, you, know, you was, are the hotel. It was a lot of rooms. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, again, fascinating that I, as someone who knew nothing about how the world of this works, learning about the tours and split weeks and all, swings and just all of this is to me, such a, a crazy part of, of this experience for you all. And, and it makes sense why you all become so close because you're, you are, you become a family. Uh, yeah. just by being in proximity to each other. And I mean, especially on stage, y'all are crawling all over each other, dancing together. You're like intimately close to each other. Well, and then, like I said, then the, imagine you go to, you're going to a new city every other week or every week or twice a week. The people that you meet in the bar downstairs are your friends from the show. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> we're all kind of socializing. We all know it's like a, a little traveling not a little, a big traveling troop, uh, you know, even if you don't drink, you'd come down to the bar and, you know, socialize. Yeah. There's, there's nobody else to hang out with. Like, you know, it's not like you're in one place living where right. you can have your groups of friends and maybe even different groups of friends. It is, that's it. Unless you happen to know somebody in the city and you're also doing this at a time where it's not now where, I mean, I travel a lot for work. I generally know an, some people in a lot of cities I go to, I can just quickly shoot them a message and be like, Hey, you want to hang out? That just didn't exist you thought, know, in, in the late eighties when you were doing this, that was much harder. So you are really together. Right. Right. The, there was no internet and there was no cell phone. Even you couldn't even, yeah. when you wanted to call home, you had to go find a pay phone yeah. and hope that they're there to answer. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Sleep or away or, you know, so, yeah, super interesting. Um, Felicia, I want to hear a little bit about, I mean, you were Demeter on tour. I know you also did, were a swing and did a couple uh, different tracks, but mm -hmm. what was your experience like? I mean, you play a very uh, unique story in there. I mean, Demeter's got a crazy backstory. Yeah. So what, what do you remember from what you were told about, you know, playing Demeter and just in general, what you remember about kind of having to live that life on stage every night uh, in such a skittish and, and crazy backstory. Yeah, I mean, I don't really remember getting a lot of the backstory, but I remember like wanting to be kind of um, like a method actress and so making up my own and, you know, of course, the whole thing with Cavity and, um, you know, she's the one that has the, the most um, empathy, I guess, for Grisbella. So mm -hmm. it was that whole connection. Um, and I just remember, you know, that them directing us or directing me to, you know, try to make sure that the fear that was present would come through, would come through the makeup, mm -hmm. come through on my face and not only in my body. So I remember something like that, but I don't think remember getting like as much of a backstory as maybe some other people did because I think being a swing, because I had been a swing, I think for like six to eight months before I took over the role. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, maybe I just didn't focus in so yeah. much on the backstory. Yeah, um, I think the swings, stuff. swings is like, don't get it, don't get somebody hurt, just kind of be in the right spot, right, don't exactly. you know, get, get through it. And then you take on the role and you get to probably create it. But, you know, it's, I think it's a little different when you go in that order. And also just in general, it doesn't sound like, as I've talked to more of you know, the tours, it sounds like now, especially with so much lore on the internet, they're, the more recent cast have more to kind of like pull from. It's like, hey, there's years of people who have done this and oh, I can go read stories that they made up. all these okay. things that yeah, yeah people made up and people that I've talked to. And, you know, back in the 80s, it's like you... You have what you were told in rehearsals and maybe what you discussed on the bus, and the, right? And like poems. And less. Yeah, it's Elliot's poems. Yeah. We went on. Or that's what I went on. Yeah. Okay. I got to ask, tell me about how you two met on tour and what that connection was like and when you realized this is, this is, this is it for life. These are, you're going to ma get married. We are married almost 31 years, but I want you to tell the story about the ham sandwich, right? Well, well first. Yeah. No, okay. So, uh. I asked about Felicia, uh, J.R. Sample, who I mentioned before, he was dating and then married somebody in the cast, Carol Schuberg. And so I had kind of an in with the cast and I said, you know, hey, how about that Felicia Ferrone? 
And uh, she came back to me and said, well, she has a boyfriend and, and you know, mm. pretty serious boyfriend. So kind of, you know, oh, OK. Then, you know, kind of we went our separate ways and not that I ever really approached her, but um, the Carol, Carol. but Carol did tell her that I was interested in her. And then uh, years later, actually, when she was doing the Broadway show. Uh, the one of my when I became the head sound man, I had an assistant who was now running the Broadway show. So we were going to go out for a drink, and I was waiting backstage. She comes down the staircase at the stage door, and I said, "Felicia Ferrone, looking good. You must be in love." And she Here's said, a- "Actually, no. Uh, what's up with you?" And I said, "I don't know. Let's." Let's finally go out, and oh, that's well, yeah, that's true. That's how we uh, that's how we started. We had our first date uh, three days later, and uh, never been apart since. So you worked together on this tour in eighty eight ish, and then it is not until nineteen ninety one that you actually go on the first date when you see each other back in New York because you're backstage at Cats, right? Right. Yes. Wow. When I'm doing right, when I'm doing that year that I finally did the year on on the Broadway, which I also was a swing, but then I did Demeter for a few months because somebody had a terrible knee injury. I think I did it um, consistently for two months, but then, yeah, and and then James and I were together, Brandon. Yeah. Wow. So, what do you remember of that that moment, Felicia, when you walked down wow. the uh, post show? Uh, was it was it right after you finished? Are you still fully dressed up as Demeter? No, I think I had, yeah, I had my street clothes on. Okay. I still remember thinking, oh, this is really great. Like, this is not, this is not a chemistry that I felt that strongly on the road because, you know, for whatever set of reasons. But then in that hallway, I, I, you know, the stairway, I did feel like, oh, this, this maybe could be something. And then it wasn't that surprising how quickly we kind of, became yeah yes yeah okay yeah all right you teased it it's it's funny because we knew of each other and we knew you know we'd been touring we toured for uh years year yeah and so you know we knew of the kind of character that she was and Mm -hmm. you know what kind of person she was and she knew what i was so we we kind of of. i probably didn't know as much as you (laughs) Did you interact a lot on the tour? Because, I mean, you're in different worlds. You're together, though, and you're traveling around together. But how much did you interact on tour? Well, I got to put my hand down her sweaty back every night to take her microphone back out. I mean, I, I groped her from behind oh. every every performance. <laughs> but tell the ham sandwich story. We were on, a, on an airplane, and uh, because they would seat us, and I didn't always take the airplane sometimes, but this was like a long bus ride. So I opted for the plane ride and we're sitting on plane and we're sitting alphabetical. So Farone Gardner and uh, so she's sitting in the middle seat. And I'm, I'm sitting on the aisle and, uh, you know, they pass out the lunch and uh, she she has she gets a ham sandwich and she's I knew she was kind of a vegetarian. And I said, so, uh, no, I just said, do you want this ham? You want the ham out of, she pulls the ham out of the sandwich and says, do you want the ham? And then he took it. And then I promptly fell asleep. And that was the only conversation we had on the plane. That's really on the plane, not just on tour in general. No, even on tour, like it was just a hi, hi, you know, it was just silly to not. Casual. Yeah. Not connect, I have to say. Right. Right. And then you. Right. I got up early. She slept in. I was, you know, uh, going out after the show. Whitewater rafting. Yeah. And all we, this you know, stuff. And I was, right. she was, yeah. I was writing letters all tweezing my eyebrows, basically, you know, that was kind of like, yeah. what it was like. And you're, but here you are. Did you have any cats, uh, fun at your wedding? Did you have any songs or music or anything that happened that played? Cause that's the connection. That's what brought you together. You know, we didn't, although we had the band, what was it? Trombone Tr- player. Trombone? Yeah. Player was, R- yeah, R- but R- he, he got us the band or he was in the band? He was in the band. The Right. So the so cat, from the your... trombone, one of the 
Kath Trombone Players rock was our wedding band. Was rock Susan. Oh, cool. His band. Band. And And uh, Stephanie Vetter, who was the person that I was at Kath's to meet, she came to the wedding. And she, we had, had, she, had, the she had a lot of friends from Kath's. Her uh, Nancy Milius was there. She, she was, was a rumple teaser. She, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So you had, you had, you, I'm just like envisioning always, you all doing like the ball, at, you know, or Copeland at the, at know, the rehearsal, you know, after. I don't think so. And I'm surprised I didn't wear my gloves, but. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, that is fun. Um, uh, Felicia, I want to hear a little bit about Broadway because that, that is a transition. You go off tour. It's not a long amount of time, but there's a little window and then this is your debut. So you get to go on at the Winter Garden uh, and, and make your debut in, in Cats. So, what is that experience like coming off the tour? And especially you went on as a swing to start. So you're kind of going in and almost don't know when your debut is going to be, right? Like you find well, out kind of late. So what is, uh, walk me through that experience. Yeah, I, I think that um, the person that I, I said had the knee injury, um, I, I think, uh, I mean, as I said, I was a swing for like nine characters at that time. <laughs> so I wasn't really sure, you know, which one I would go on for. I, and actually, wait, did I go on for her first? I guess I did. I, I, I remember making my Broadway debut as Demeter, so I guess I did. I did go on for other people later. But anyhow, um, yeah, and they just came to me and said, tonight's going to be it. She's out and she's, you know, she's hurt and tonight's going to be it. So I called the family from New Jersey and all yeah. the family, family came and some friends that were even in New York. Uh, Nancy, I'm pretty sure, was there. And her dad, I think, even. Or maybe he just took us out to dinner. Um, anyway, yeah, and I remember, yeah. well, we just, it, it just happened. So it was a little d obviously different than somebody else's Broadway debut where you're rehearsing for all those weeks and then everybody's debuting together. But still, it was mine and it was super exciting. And I remember being very tearful, you know, in, in a happy way backstage. And, and yeah, that was, that how was, was, how was that performance? Like, I, I'm, I'm always interested at how is that performance? Cause it's something, you know, so well, you did it so many times and then you get to go do really the same thing, but on at the winter garden on this Broadway stage. That's a good question. So is, is that first performance? Like, is it really nerve wracking? Like, or is it just, you know, it, it's this muscle memory at this point. It was probably a little of both because the show on Broadway was different. Some somewhat different than you know little little tiny nuances mm -hmm. that are different than that tour was, and um, but I but I did know it very well, and uh, I don't think I was nervous about the performance. I just was, I think I was heightened emotionally just because of what it was. Finally, you know, making your Broadway debut. I was thirty years old. Not that that's old, but it's certainly not. You know, young, I've been at the business for like eight years by then. So mm -hmm. it was, you know, super heightened emotionally, I think. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back for more of The Wrong Cat Died. Okay, I want to, I want to go back to tour because one of my favorite things to hear from the tours four and five especially are what are your memorable stories? What are the things that you will never forget from that time on the road, whether they're funny things, um, experiences stuff that happened on stage stuff that happened with sound you know that that you are always going to be in your head years later so let's let's hear a couple of those fun ones you know you have a really good one i just have one i don't know if it's going to come off fun the way that i described it yeah I, you know one of those things probably had to be there but i had these little mules you know like the slippers with you know with the fur on them and my little robe and I was uh, always room, most of the time rooming with the gentleman who played Skimble Shanks, Kevin Winkler, who actually wrote um, Big Deal and uh, Tommy Toon. Uh, but Kevin Winkler um, is, is now an author. Anyway, so I was rooming with him and he didn't feel well. And he asked me to go out, you know, to the vending machine and get us Coke or ginger ale or whatever it was. And, soda. and so I went with my little mules and my little robe. And I see all the stagehands coming. I don't know where they were coming from. They were coming out of the theater. Or they were just getting off the bus or something like that. We were in one of those kind of like motels where, you know, the, mm -hmm. the doors open right out into the onto yeah. footwork. And um, and they were like, you're getting him soda? We, we, no, I mean, I explained what I was doing. And I just remember them going into a burst of laughter and 
coming back and telling Kevin the story. And it, it always was something that, you know, Kevin and I just laughed about and still to this day we laugh about. Um, as I said, it's probably one of those things we you, had. You going to get him sort of just being. Yeah, with that, with that outfit on, with that. Particular. Oh, fully, yeah, fully. The roll, the amount, little shoe. Yeah, the whole, the whole and, get up. <laughs> and then the thing she had saying, oh my God, I can't believe you're doing that. And it's just, it was very funny. I'm sure you were a visual at that yeah, point. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's what it was. Again, you're thankful you're pre camera phones of everyone just, you know, you're, you, you would end up on social Sorry. media. Oh, of course. Someone being like, what did I see today? Yeah. Exactly. But and James, uh, what about you? What, what do you remember? We had a, uh, uh, somebody organized a uh, whitewater rafting trip when we were in Sacramento and a lot of people, maybe 25 people, uh, went. And so there were like five, you know, they put like five people in five boats. And mm-hmm. so you know, in the calm parts, I don't know if you've ever gone whitewater rafting. I have. I've done a lot not, of it. Well, yeah. right. not, there wasn't a lot of rapids, but there was a lot of, you know, just kind of fun. And, you know, you they give you buckets and you fill up the buckets and you, you go over to the other boat and you throw a bucket of water on yeah. the left. So four of the boats were gray and we were in a gray boat. And some of the actors, Eddie Buffum and uh, they were... Uh, the actor, Mr. Mistopheles and his, he, his girlfriend and, uh, who was in the show too. But, um, you know, there were like five actresses, actor, actresses in this boat. And so we started this chant, let's sink the blue boat. And then we would take the paddles, let's sink the blue boat, you know? And so we're like paddling and singing this song and going after oh, them. God. And they're like, you know, but they, 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 were, they were like, well, <laughs> they were like, Hold on. Yeah, maybe, you know. But anyway, these trips with me, yeah. The five of us in in the blue, in in the non blue boat, we just thought it was a howl. And, uh, you know, it was quite quite the uh, commentary for a week or two about the, uh, you know. You're out out there making your own jellical choice, trying to to knock some cats into the water here. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I have, I've white water rafted a, a fair amount in my life. And that is exactly what happens when you are calm especially if you're going down threes fours or fives you know like some of the stuff that's pretty heavy then it gets kind of boring you just start to try to knock people out of the boat it's how can you how can you have some fun out there in a safe way right you know they're not oh no it was crazy no no we i mean you know but it you know it just made for it enlightened the adventure and there was at the end of it there was like a four and you know that was pretty you know, but it was kind of at the very end of the of the trip, so most of it was kind of just you know having fun and being out in the sun. And everybody, it was a really nice company. Everybody on that. You must have uh, heard about that a lot. You know, yeah. It's Cats Four, uh, especially, was just really a, uh, a lot of fun and good people all around. Um, you know, all the people that I worked with went on to uh, you know, like I said, my boss Kevin. He he's the uh, house flyman on a Broadway show, um, in a broad on a Broadway house. Uh, Nick Romano, who was the other electrician, he's the technical director at Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, Tom Lowry, he uh, he was also a head electrician on Broadway shows, and uh, so you know, just a really bright, you know, fun, a really people. kind, it's just such nice, yeah. thing, really nice, yeah. Thing. I mean, honestly, the uh, you all have introduced me. Your cast has introduced me to so many of each other, and that speaks volumes because it's been thirty plus years, and the level of of connection and you know friendship you all still have is is clear and evident in just the way everyone has talked about each other, and you know even off mic has shared about each other is really really cool to see and speaks volumes to the people that went out and and did this and the friendships that y'all made. Right, I, James. I got to ask though, as the sound, do you have any memories of any horror stories of where some place stuff went horribly wrong because the house wasn't ready for you, or or just places oh. that were harder than others? Oh, sure, sure. The sound is is the most difficult job. You know, no matter what anybody tells you, you're, you know, you have to listen or be on it for every single word. Um, and, mm-hmm. and 
There was one place, uh, Salt Lake City, when we played, uh, stage house right stood up with a standing ovation and the house left did not. So the next day I asked to come in early and I readjusted my speakers. And then for the next show, everybody stood up together. I mean, <laughs> probably had nothing to do huh? with me, but it was just like that. Like, it has to be me, you know, type of, uh, yeah. I see what you, you know, and it's like, you know, but yeah, I mean, you're definitely part of it. And, uh, you know, trying to do your best and make the show sound as natural as possible. And, uh, you know, like I said, every word you try to, you know, make it so that you have every word. But there was one, you know, and and the problem is that you go to a different theater and the acoustics in every single building are different. And there was Completely. one theater I remember that you could, we were doing, we did a sound check every every house. So I would have an assist, you know, the assistant, like the assistant would run the sound check and I would walk the house to hear it. And there was one that had these domes in the ceiling. And so you'd be walking along and all you could hear would be like, say, the trumpet player. And then you'd walk along and then you'd just hear the clarinet player. Then you'd walk along and you'd just hear the piano or the bass. Or, you know, it was like it was a crazy dome that just, you know, it, it was like, you know, in uh, um, uh, Get Smart when he has the cone of silence. Yes. I mean, it was almost <laughs> like a cone of music, you know, and it's like. <laughs> That's all they would hear. If you sat in that seat, it was like, I was just going like, this is absurd. So, uh, yeah. It's, and it's gotta be hard too, when you're doing it for a week. So you, you know, when you're in on Broadway or, or on yes. a much longer time, you get to figure out all of those pockets and fix those things, but you get such a short window and I've, you know, growing up in Indiana, I've seen a lot of touring Broadway and I've caught a lot of shows on night one. And night one of the show versus, you know, a week or two weeks later, sometimes you hear just a little bit of like, oh, that, the mic didn't get on quite as quick as there. And it's it's got to just be getting used to the new environment. And, you know, it's never material enough to to make a difference in the show, but it is some of those little things you, you pick sure. up and has to be crazy to deal with city sure. to city to city. Absolutely. And it's also harder, you know, the thing that I didn't really realize is it's hard for the performers too because cats didn't have any vocal feedback and so it would some houses like you know you'd go up on date like a, a you know i had a grizabella say like i can't hear anything and i like went up on stage and it's like wow yeah i i, I don't hear you know i mean it was just like it was like a big suck of of sound huh. that you could literally not even really hear yourself and wow. yet other places you'd go and it would be like, you know, hey, uh, turn down the, the fold back. And I go, yeah, no, there is no fold back. Yeah. the way it is. Wow. So, is, yeah. I mean, the acoustics and learning about that was being in it. Um, we rarely got complaints, but, um, you know, it was it, it was a, a difficult um, at best, you know, because, it yeah. is, you know, the microphones were run through the wigs. And stuck mm -hmm. out here, and you know, they wanted to hear, and it, and the dynamic of the show from you know a whisper all the way to you know the jellyful ball where it's super loud, and yeah, you know, electric guitars, and you know, almost a rock and roll show. So it's the dynamics and trying to maintain that dynamic so that it you know that becomes part of the show. Yeah, it has such it has so many parts to it. You've got. As you said, the quiet moments, you've got the loud moments, you've got belting, you've got super fast songs, you've got a little bit slower, you've got more instrumental with the overture, and then you've got more singing. Uh, what I think helps this show, though, is it's so visually stunning that it adds to it. So it's it's both components working together. It's that audio and visual together. Whereas there's some other shows, if you don't hear the dialogue, you're probably sunk. And, you know, there doesn't matter what's happening in front of you. If you can't hear them, you're not doing it. Cats is so confusing from start to finish anyways, what? that, that you gotta, you gotta at least watch to, to pick up some. Right. Um, I, had, I had more than one person come up to me at this, you know, because the, the, the audio desk is in usually at the back of the house. Some theaters, it was in the middle of the house, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, you're out in the audience so that you yeah. hear what they hear. 
And I had more than one and person. And what they say. Yeah, what <laughs> they say. And I had more than one person come up to you and go, uh, uh, what's this about? I don't get it. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and you say, yeah, well, sure. and yeah, well, there's nothing I really to get. Said that, yeah. well, you said, I've been on tour with them for eight months and I don't know either. And that's it. I've actually sat back. Um, I've had tickets before to other shows where I've been next to the sound. And I actually don't, I can't do it anymore because I was watching that more. I was fascinated by what was happening in there. And so I've had to make sure I'm not near that anymore. Cause same thing with, I've been really close to the pit. And I just, I watched the conductor the whole time. I'm like, I'm barely watching the show and that's, you know, not why you're there. Um, but I find those pieces of this whole, like there's so many components to a show and more than just what's on stage and all of it has to work together. And, and most people aren't going to grasp that. Like I, one of the first things I usually do in a show, if I'm, if I'm low enough is look behind to see the TV screens with the conductor to cue everybody and just see kind of how that looks and how that's being played out. But it's definitely a major piece. I want to go to some rapid fire because I want to hear, we got to get to the most important question of the night. Um, but before we do that, let's have some some uh, fun cats related questions. So uh, each of you, I want you both to answer. So if you could go on for one night only as any cat just to perform, whether you could do it or couldn't do it, male, female, it doesn't matter. If you just want to go on for one night, who are you going on as? I'd go on as Growl Tiger. Growl Tiger. Okay. Yeah. And then I would like to be his Jelly Lorem so that we could perform it together. Okay. That's so wholesome. That's such a wholesome answer. So I always would have loved to play that part as well. Yeah. Who are your favorite and least favorite cats? So ignore the people who played them, but just right. character wise, personality wise, which one would you be best friends with and which one would drive you crazy? Hmm. I always liked uh, Monk, uh, the yeah. storyteller. Uh, our original Monk was had a beautiful voice and just told it in this golden voice. And uh, I just love uh, the Monk monkey strap uh, part. And um, I don't know. Um, I don't know who I don't really like. Do you like McCavity? Uh, McCavity, yeah. He's kind of a pain in the... Well, Brow yeah. Tiger... No, not Growl Tiger. Rum Tom Tugger, he's a bit of, a, you know, a blowhard. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, what about you? I would say that, um, you know, obviously I had a, um, a love-hate relationship with McCavity, and so I would say mm-hmm. he would be somebody I wouldn't want to meet in an alley. But that um, maybe my favorite was Jelly Lorum. Definitely soft spot for Demeter, Victoria, Syllabub. I guess the ones that I, you know. Yeah, all the ones you got to do. Yeah. <laughs> right. Was it I know? Uh, I yeah, yeah. What are uh what's your favorite song from the show? Well, we as a family like Skimble Shanks because when our kids were little, it would, we always called it the Christmas song. We you know. Just, yeah. Because of all the tinklies. Yeah, yeah. Um, just have it. um and I think the Jellicle Ball is beautiful. The music is beautiful. For sure. Um, what was that? Was your question favorite? Yeah, favorite song. So, Stimble Shanks is great. I think it's such a fun, upbeat, quick paced song. And the favorite song, the favorite piece I loved to sing was the lead up into Grizabella's first entrance. Yeah. <laughs> Is it the yeah. Glamour Cat piece? Yes. That yeah. Piece. And you really know this show very well now, don't you? I, I, inside and out. It's kind of crazy because if you would ask me, I guess it's been almost four years now. I knew I knew nothing. All I remember from the first time is I could not get Mungo Jerry and Rumple Teaser out of my head. That was the one song that just over and over and over again. And I, I sang that the whole way home. Now I know... I know your version less because I've seen the revival version more, but I've also seen the 1998 movie. And so that's, again, kind of has it. But yeah, I've started to pick up a lot of it at this point. Did you see the recent movie? I I have. It is now on Netflix. Uh, It's actually what started the show. I mean, it was that trailer that uh, when it released, it was that trailer that day I made the joke about Grizabella. And that was the genesis of this podcast. So 
without that 2019, for better or worse, uh, this, we would not be here right now uh, having this conversation. So as crazy as that sh movie was, it is, it's why we're here. Well, then there's one good thing that came out of the movie. <laughs> I, I, it is an experience. That's what I'll say about it. It is a, an experience to watch it. Uh, and we'll just leave it at that. But well, that um, is, you say what song you liked? No, I like the, uh, yeah, I, I like, uh, also, I mean, I'm a little prejudiced, but, uh, I like, uh, bomb song, the, uh, cat, the McCavity with the duet. Um, yeah. Yeah. But that's because I, you know, I liked somebody's voice a lot. So yeah, for, for sure. Um, okay. I asked one fun one before we get to the, uh, to the, the million dollar question, my fun one for you both, and you can combine, you can think together on your answer, but which cat do you think would make the best sound electrician? So which one would, uh, would be doing your job, James, who would be best at it? Oh yeah. I guess same thing. Monk, you know, he, he's pretty cool cat, but you know, on the street, I would say like, you know, you'd come out the stage door and people would say, oh. What part, what, what cat did you play? And I go, oh yeah, I played the sound cat. Yeah. I would say Skimble Shanks. So I, those are my two thoughts. I did have this thought of like, there's maybe some magical version that Mustafwis could do, but he would probably not be good at actually cueing all the stuff and making sure it all works. But some of it, to me, it's, it feels magical because I don't understand how most of it works. I'm like, oh yeah, he could do it too. But I think those were my first two answers were Monk and Skimble. Oh, they're the, really? Because they're the two that I think would be um, buttoned up enough to be able to yep. handle it and smart enough to be able to handle the sophistication that goes behind that. Because you got to be organized. You got to be on top of, I just been thinking of 30 plus microphones that you're putting through and making sure the right one's going on at the right time and the right stuff. Like that takes some organization and that takes some ability, which is what Skimble would be good at. But Monk is also kind of your natural... Uh, leader okay. cool. of running cool. through yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. He's, um, he's cool. He's collected. Okay, we're we're at the the most important question, in my opinion, which is I've argued at length. I don't think Grizabella is the right Jellicle choice. Can you so tell I'm us the argument? Can you tell us? The I argument? will after. I don't want to oh. skew your argument. I don't want to skew your answers here. So I will tell you my argument after. Um, but I want to hear your. Uh, I don't think you debated this in uh, when you were on tour. But I would love to hear if you are picking today, are you picking Grizabella or are you picking somebody else? I'd love to hear why either way. I have to say, I never really thought of anybody else but Grizabella. She just seems like natural choice. And actually, you know, with her, you know, costume being dirty and gringy and everything. But yeah, no, I, I can't say I ever really thought like, oh, yeah, that's, it's, you know. So now that you're thinking about it today, are you still, she's still your answer or are you going to, you know, uh, I think we both said maybe it could be Gus yeah. instead because he seems even older mm -hmm. and you know, he definitely deserves, deserves it. If there's, you know, that's what we're going on and, um, that it doesn't mean that Grizabella can't go next year. I, that's my argument right now. Well, that's is, your argument. So that was well. Your... I'll give you the the short version of how we got here. My original argument is I saw Leona Lewis as Grizabella, who was an X Factor. So I originally thought, what's the best? What's if America's voting or Britain's voting or whoever's voting as that show, which has a history of making um, bands? So Fifth Harmony, One Direction, all right. of those came from that show. My original joke was, I want who had the mo most entertaining performances that I remembered at the time. And I want a Tugger Mustafeles duo going if you're wow. doing it by vote. So that was my original joke. If you really think about like detailed thoughts of how it goes and like my real answer to if I'm crafting the story, I do think Grizabella, I've seen a lot more younger Grizabellas, especially on the most recent tours. Like and I think Grizz, just, just, yeah, like the performers are just younger. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to be like, this girl's lived her you know, rough and tumble life when they're in their young 20s or, you know. So it, it's is as great as the performers are, as great as the singing is. I'm like, she should go next year. Spend a year with her family. You welcome her back. Yeah. Why? Why? Why not just let her, like, why immediately sacrifice her 
and send Gus this year and she can go next year. And I think you get the same redemption story and arc and all of that piece. Part of me jokingly, not jokingly, what I really want is I want a tour or a regional production to do it with a different choice every night based on an audience vote. So I want to, I want the night that your whole family's in the crowd to be voting for Demeter. And I want Demeter to get that harness on and go up that night. And it's a you different choice every night. One like that? You don't think that happened no. yet? Not that I've ever heard. I know there is, the pack is doing in New York, the new ballroom cats uh, this summer. So that will be a, a variation of cats, but it's not a different jokical choice. It's a totally different conceptual view of it. So that's the only one I've heard that has like, that's not pure parody. I've heard some parodies, mm-hmm. but that's the only version. I, I think it can be done and I'm waiting for a call well, we to help. Well, there was a Broadway show that had, you had a choice. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was the name of that? Edwin one? Drood is what Edwin I've been told. Drive. I've never seen it, but yeah, everyone tells great. me that. Right, right. There you go. So that's what I want. Right. But instead of just four choices, you could have anyone you wanted. Anyone. I, uh, let's, we've got the technology. Everyone's got a phone in their pocket. We just pause for a minute, let people throw something up, and then everyone's trained to go get on, on the tire or whatever the mechanism is, and we're ready to go. You no, know, it's so true. And then the harmonies are all set, and everybody can sing the same way, and up the person goes, and that's it. The only flaw i see in this which i think we could work out is whoever sings the addressing of cats at the end i know it's everybody but whoever like really sings most of it if they go we've got to have somebody ready to to do that because that comes after right that's after deuteronomy wasn't there and of course he would be one of the old yeah he'd he'd be it oh i i envision this less about some about like who deserves and who kind of like who has the performance that night who really brought it but i think it's a lot of it would just be Who's who's got their dance class or their family or yeah, the, who's got the crowd on their side that Ooh, night, which I think is a fun piece. Yeah, and you know, the thing about Deuteronomy having somebody sing for him, there's probably one of the covers or another that are already in costume on stage in another role that can easily move in over. Those it. are minor details we can work yeah. out as we go. I keep saying this now in almost every episode, hoping that eventually someone hears me and is like, that's a good idea. I'm going to do it. So uh, like, I'm here for it. For somebody that's directing. Do you, have you done some of these interviews with people that are directors of the show and dance just, supervisors? I'm just starting to talk to people. I've talked to a few dance captains. I've talked to now um, PSM. Uh, I've talked to casting directors, but most people have also done it. So it's not just just that, or they were like, you know, uniquely tied to it in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, I've yet to talk to a director. I've got a couple that I uh, have been in contact with and would like to talk to, but we got to schedule and get everything there. But if you have recommendations or you know people, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready for anybody who wants to come on. Everyone who listens, many people message me and mm-hmm. um, I am, I'm always looking for the next episode. And until I get my... My new jellical choice. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep talking into this microphone. This has been so fun. It's been so fun to hear your stories and your experiences and how your your fate happened on tour and then at the Winter Garden uh, to bring you two together and your cat's family. Yeah, yeah. No, I I always say I uh, I owe my my entire life to cats. <laughs> Yeah, I, now I, and forever. You are truly you know, now and forever. Uh, yeah, I know we don't have too much time, but I just want to say, James actually got engaged to someone else on that tour, but then they broke up. Okay. So this there was a rocky road here. You are but you are cast are. through and through, and you're here. But here today, and that's what matters. You're happy and here today. Two children, and uh, one of them is now uh, in Japan working for Universal in Japan. Our son oh, nice. just started. So it's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Well, there that has been a, a production I've always wanted to talk to. Not not Universal, but the Cats in Japan has got a, a crazy long production that has gone on for years and it's pretty incredible, I've heard. So uh, hopefully your your uh, kids will be able to see it there. Well, you know how long it's been there? Yeah. Oh, many years. I don't know if it's still on. It kind of goes on and off a bunch, but it's well, it's gone on for it's a very um, well, well oiled machine does some of the coolest marketing I've ever seen. Um, very, very, very good production that's happened for a long time. So a lot of these productions kind of pop on and off. So it's mm-hmm. like it's on tour and then it stops and then it comes back. 
I know Royal Caribbean is about to go back out in March and um, probably around when this is coming out, there's going to be a whole new cast going out and doing that. And then I'm sure wow. it'll pop up all over the place. It feels like it never ends. So it's been cool to, to see all her. the different. Exactly. But this has been amazing. So thank you again so much for spending time with us today. Great. Thanks for having right. us. And thanks everyone else for listening to this episode of the Ron Cat Died, the podcast breakdown, the cast catastrophe. To follow along, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any else listed podcast. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, or threads at The Wrong Cat Died, or check out our website, theroncatdied.com.